it's hard to add that bit of bloom to the sound with processing. It's a lot easier to take it away than it is to add it. I'm tuning with the miking in mind. I'm tuning with the miking in mind. Hey there, my name is Joel. I am going to talk about my approach to tuning bass drums in this video. A few weeks ago, I did a video on tuning snare drums and got a lot of good feedback on that. Thank you very much. And I got a lot of requests for people wanting me to kind of continue to do the bass drum and toms and things like that. So I'm, I'm doing it. This is my approach to recording the bass drum. The bass drum that I'm using for this video is a late 70s Ludwig. It's a heavy six ply maple poplar shell from the six ply heavy shell days of Ludwig. It's a 24 by 14. It's only 14 inches deep. It's not a, a, a very deep kick. I personally prefer 14 inch deep kicks because they tend to have a little bit more bottom end when they're recorded. Uh, for some reason, deeper drums don't seem to bloom so much at the bottom end, but they tend to have a lot more attack or definition, which is good too. But the way that I record kicks, I get plenty of attack when I need it and I can control the balance of body and attack uh, when I'm processing after the fact. I'm gonna talk specifically in this video about tuning the drum, setting it up, uh, muffling, that kind of thing. Uh, and there is a companion video with this on my other channel, Recording.Pizza, that I will link to below for people who want to know about miking a kick drum and processing it, EQ and dynamics processing, things like that, either for recording or for live sound. Uh, this is specifically about the drum and tuning and setting it up. The other is more about finishing it with miking and processing and all of that. So the two together, uh, for people who record their own drums, I think you'll find that very interesting. Uh, but again, this is just for the drum side of things. So like I say, it's a 24 by 14 inch kick drum. The uh, front head is just a Ludwig Heavy. It's what's been on the drum forever and ever. As you can see, I've got it completely detuned. I've got the back head detuned as well. The head, the batter head that I'm using is an Aquarian Response 2. It's a dual seven ply head. This one's coated. I like personally double ply heads for batters for bass drums. I'm not a giant fan of bass drum heads that have a lot of padding or rings or things like that on them. That's kind of a finished, polished sound, mostly for short, staccato defined kind of kick drums. And they're a really quick, effective way of getting there. But I'm kind of a control freak by nature, and so sometimes I don't want that sound. I want something that's got more bloom and more sustain. I'm a kind of a big Jack Joseph Puig fan, for those of you who may uh, know him, the producer and engineer. He gets these really great blooming bass drum sounds, very defined, but have this really nice sort of resonance after the attack. And I like that, and that's kind of what I tune for. So for that reason, I like a single ply head on the front. Uh, with no muffling rings or any kind of thing. I like the dual ply on the back. Even though it's two plies, it actually uh, sustains and resonates more than uh, a single ply with the little Mylar ring underneath. You know, uh, that even though it's a single ply head, it tends to be a little more staccato sounding, and this actually has a little bit more sustain behind it. So this is my general kind of head combination that I prefer. So let's get started messing with this drum. Both heads are detuned right now. I've got a towel here that if you fold over, you can set the drum on it and it will mute the front head so you can work with just one head at a time. So the first thing I'm gonna do, this is not a brand new head, it's actually fairly new, but I've already been using it. Uh, but I've loosened it up and I'll just show you kind of what I do. I typically will first and foremost push in the middle, which kind of pulls it in and centers the head. And then I'm going to finger tension all of the lugs on the drum. Okay, so when I got all those fingers tight, now, because it's a new head, I'm going to kind of seat it and sort of stretch it out a little bit. And I will literally put my knee, I'm not really a lightweight guy, and I just lean on it pretty solidly. Just kind of stretch the head out a little. I do that often before I tension it, um, sometimes you can do it after the fact. Uh, I just want to kind of let it start to stretch out a little bit more and uh, do a little bit more finger tightening. Just get the key rods kind of ready to go. And then I'll grab my key and I'm going to take this up 
about a half turn each. Uh, before I go any further, I'm just going to let you know that I'm actually doing two sounds in this video. One is a blooming, resonant, uh, sustain, you know, kind of a boom kick drum sound, which I really like a lot of times. Uh, but then there are also times when you want a really staccato defined attack and very short, thumpy bass drum. And so I'm going to do both of those sounds and you'll see the tuning of the heads doesn't really change much between them. It's mostly how the drum is muffled. Okay, so so far I've done a half turn on each one of the key rods and I'm just going to do like I did in the snare video, kind of mute the, the resonance of the head a little bit and just kind of check the tuning. Okay, um, as rattly and as low pitched and as sort of not tensioned as that is, you can still sort of tell relatively that one's a little bit lower. But you hear this? There's like a rattle or a papery sound here where there's not tension on this part of the head. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just add some more tension overall. This is a 24 inch drum, by the way. I've already said that a couple times, but that's actually important. Because I know if you've watched uh, videos on tuning bass drums, you have undoubtedly seen people tuning a 22-inch bass drum, and they may or may not be telling you it's a 22-inch bass drum. And, and I just tune up, I push down, and I tune each one until there are no wrinkles, and then I just back off a quarter turn or something like that. And honestly, that works superbly. It's a really good way to tune drums that are 22 inches or even smaller. But a 24-inch you're getting pretty big. It's a lot more surface area, a lot more real estate there. And that level of tension really kind of leads to a rather flat sound. Uh, it needs a little more tension than that. So just thought I would reiterate this is a 24 inch head. And the reason I said that is because as you can see already, I don't know if the angle shows, but as I push down here, there are a little bit of a wrinkle right here and a little bit over here still. So I can actually kind of get rid of the wrinkles a little bit. But that's not going to probably be enough tension on the drum. It might, it might not. And you can push down some more, stretch the head out now that it's under tension. We'll kind of show you where spots are. With a lot of tension, you will still get wrinkles. And I'm going to keep checking it. Now with regular drums, regular drums, with snare drums and toms and things, um, each time you play them, you're not hitting in the exact same spot. You might be hitting in the middle or off to the side or whatever. Bass drum's different because the beater's hitting in the exact same spot every single time. If you've got two beaters, they're hitting the same spots every time. So... Having each lug like the others isn't really quite the same for a bass drum uh, because it's being hit in the same spot. So whatever the sound is, it's consistent because of that. Uh, additionally, they tend to have more muffling than most other drums as well. So they don't have a whole lot of sustain or particularly a pitch uh, that maybe can get weird if it's not all in tune together. So bass drums are a little different in that respect. I don't get too wound up about everything being exactly the same. What I'm looking for when I turn the drum over, I'm going to mute the front head a little bit. Okay, that's a little low, not quite enough tone. I just want to take the tension up enough to get a solid tone. Again, I'm not after a pitch. In fact, if the pitch is too pure, I will often change the tension of the lugs, high, low, high, low, etc. Trying to eliminate the pitch because the pitch may work great in one key. Play a song in a different key and now the bass drum's getting in the way if you have a, a, a nice long sustaining resonant sound. You can hear it now start to resonate, starting to actually have some low end. You can also hear the, uh, the spur uh, mount here vibrating. It's getting better. I'm going to go a little bit higher with it. I don't want to go high pitched. I'm not doing a jump bottom type thing here. 
but I do want it to produce some low end. And it's not really gonna do that when the head is basically, you know, flat a la 22 inch drums. Okay, that's a decent starting point. I'm gonna go to the front here, do the same basic approach, finger tighten. Now with the hole here, you know, the, the, the head will resonate, but it's not going to resonate like a head that doesn't have a hole in it. So that'll also affect the pitch around the hole itself. So again, I'm not looking for a totally uniform sound. Also because the way I tune and muffle the drum for a more open sound, which is really kind of my favorite, um, the, the front head gets very little in the way of muffling. I really want it to have some sustain. And if that sustain, again, is tuned to a pitch, then it's gonna work well in some songs and not in another. So I don't want a pitch, I just want a, a tone from the front head. And that right now sounds like it's okay. If I was feeling like I was getting too much pitch, and maybe when you mic it up and audition it and listen to it, you might be doing that, then I might start to detune certain lugs or whatever to try to eliminate any sense of pitch, but still to generally just keep a sense of sustain. Now that is a pretty um, rattly kind of sound. You put a dynamic mic with proximity effect and all of that going on, it's gonna be a very, very big sound. But I am going to pad this down a little bit also because the interior of this thing is actually finished. It's sealed and Ludwig at the time, the lacquer that they were using inside the drums, it's kind of a matte satin sort of finish, but it's a pretty hard finish and as a result, the drum kind of takes on a basketball-like characteristic. It kind of pings the, the high frequency from the attack. That's going to bounce around inside the drum, and it sounds, well, it sounds like this. And that's not particularly an attractive sound, so I am going to eliminate that by putting something soft inside and the softness will give those high frequencies a place to go. This will absorb the high frequencies. It's not really gonna add much mass, but this thing is actually right at 14 inches deep. So when I put it in, it will actually touch the front head and touch the back head. But there's not enough mass really here to do a whole lot in the way of muffling or shortening the sound. But a little bit. Okay, so I just grabbed a mallet so I could hit this thing. Now, as crazy as that sounds, I'm sure from the mic here in the room, it's very papery sounding, but up close, particularly with the proximity effect of a microphone, that's actually a much richer, deeper sound than one might think. However, I do think it's still a little uncontrolled. So I'm actually gonna bring the tension up a little bit more. Not so much worried about the front as I am the back. I wanna make sure it's producing more of a tone and less of the flat papery rattle, which does work well with smaller diameters. But because this is a 24 inch drum, it really benefits from a little more tension. Now I'm getting a pitch, boom, boom, boom. And I don't really want that. So you can sometimes just reduce a couple of lugs. Usually I do the top ones because they're easy to get to. And that's a good sound. Now, I don't want the front head to be muffled much at all. It's kind of an out of control sound if you actually play the head. Actually, still, that's a pretty good sound. Sometimes, though, it can feel papery. Let me actually back off the tension so I can show you what I mean. 
I back off the tension a little bit. It can take on kind of a papery sound, and that is not necessarily bad. Because I'm going to use two mics on this drum, and I'll go into more detail about those in the recording side of this video, in the, the link that I'll give you. But that's a little more rattly. And I'm actually going to leave it there because that, again, it's not really producing a pitch, but it is producing some sustain. Boom, it goes all the way to there. Boom, that's where it stops. So it's a long sound. Yeah, and so I can take that, and if I don't like that length, I can shorten it with dynamics processing. I can use noise gates, or I can, I can do a variety of things to sort of limit that a little bit. If I'm using a pre-muffled head that doesn't really resonate much like that, uh, it doesn't have that sustain, and a back head that's like, already pre-muffled and all that. Um, it's hard to add that bit of bloom to the sound with processing. It's a lot easier to take it away than it is to add it. Again, I'll go into that in the other video, but since I'm tuning the drum, I'm tuning with the miking in mind. So I would recommend you do the same because then the engineer has the ability to kind of make of the sound what he or she wants. Okay, so I do want a little more control on the back head because that is a little rattly. So I'm going to take this little thing here, little Evans pillow, uh, and I'm going to put it in the drum like so. So it's going to actually be sitting on top of this foam. There's not a lot of mass here, but the back of it I will set so that it is leaning against the back head. So it's adding more muffling to the back head, but it won't really even be touching the front head. So the front head's not going to change, but the back head will have a little bit more. Yeah, back head will have a little bit more muffling, so it'll be a little more control. There we go. So that's a short sound that will have plenty of definition from the mic inside the drum, lots of attack. In fact, that's mostly what you'll get from that mic. And then the outside will have this resonance, this sort of non-specific pitch, low frequency sound that can be processed to create some really awesome bloom. So that's a big resonant tone, really, really cool. And this front head resonating, being picked up by this mic, picking up all the low frequency bloom and that sustain that can be processed to really be accentuated or limited if necessary. It just adds a really good balance and overall nice bass drum sound. If you want a shorter sound, as a lot of pop music or country music, you often want just sort of a, a low frequency thump that sort of hits and goes away, nice attack, all that stuff. I'm gonna use the same mics the same tuning, but I'm adding a blanket. This is sort of a medium weight. It's kind of like a soft packing blanket. I don't think it's actually a packing blanket. Not sure exactly what it is. But use what you got. The idea is not really to bury the drum in a lot of fluffy mass, but just really to position this inside so that it's stopping the action of both heads. So each one can kind of breathe a little bit but then they, they cut off pretty quickly because they just can't compete with the uh, fluffy mass pressed against them. <laughs> 